This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, we spend the rest of the hour with a woman who described herself as a fierce, working-class domestic goddess. She's the award-winning actor, one of the country's best-known comedians, Roseanne Barr. In the late 80s and early 90s, she starred in the popular and groundbreaking show on television titled simply Roseanne, the first TV series to openly advocate for gay rights. Roseanne featured the first lesbian kiss on TV in an episode when Roseanne kisses Mariel Hemingway. That's right, the actress and granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway. Roseanne was also the first sitcom to ever feature a gay marriage. The series tackled other controversial topics as well — poverty, class, abortion, feminism. From her open support of unions and earlier shows to her tribute to Native Americans toward the end of the series, Roseanne never shied away from contentious issues. The writer Barbara Ehrenreich once praised Roseanne Barr for representing, quote, the hopeless underclass of the female sex, polyester-clad, overweight occupants of the slow track, fast food waitresses, factory workers, housewives, members of the invisible pink-collar army, the despised, the jilted, the underpaid. Roseanne received an Emmy and a Golden Globe Award. She came to our studios last week, and I began the interview with Roseanne Barr with a clip from the first episode of Roseanne, which aired in 1988. Send me that detergent coupon. Back it! Dan! What? This thing's all backed up again. I'll plunge it right after breakfast. Well, I don't want you to plunge it. I want you to fix it now. You got it, babe. This is the third time this week. You've got to fix it today. Absolutely. Mom, my book bag just fell apart. I just bought it yesterday. Mom, please, you got to take it back. All right, I'll do it after work. <sighs> Bye! Goodbye. Did you meet with Darlene's teacher today? I can't do it today, babe. I'm putting in a bid on a job. If I get it, me and Freddie start construction this afternoon. Well, how about this book bag? Can you exchange that? Could you fit that into your tight schedule there? <laughs> I'll do that or fix the sink. Okay, fix the sink. I'll do everything else, like I always do. <laughs> I'll have to get off work an hour early, lose an hour's pay, totally rearrange my whole schedule. <laughs> But I don't mind. <laughs> Roseanne Barr has recently returned to primetime with a new reality TV show on Lifetime called, well, Roseanne's Nuts, about life on her nut farm in Hawaii. She's also just published a new book. It's called Roseanarchy. Dispatches from the Nut Farm. Roseanne Barr is with us now. Welcome to Hi, Democracy Amy. Now. Hi, it's great to be with you. It's great to be with you. To see too. you, not on the silver screen, not in my little TV, but right here. That's how I feel about you, too. You are real. You are real, too, yeah. <laughs> We're kind of real. But the thing is, that actually is why Roseanne, the show that just blew everything out of the water, was so successful, is because it was real. It was you. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it talked to, it had a voice that hadn't been on television before. So I think it was, you know, more the voice than me. But uh, I was, of course, thrilled to be part of that voice. Well, before we talk about showbiz and um, television and film and comedy, I want to talk about your life, how you came to be the woman you are. Well, Where were you born, Roseanne? I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, in 1952, November 3rd. Oh, right around Election Day. Yep. And we'll talk about your running for president in a little while. But um, so Salt Lake City. Yeah. What was that like? It was pretty much, uh, well, it was different. It was kind of, in many ways, a baptism by fire to be there, to be, uh, to be a smart girl, a smart fat girl, and a smart fat Jewish girl. Or, those were like... Uh, a lot of factors, and to be a smart, fat Jewish girl of working class, uh, or, you know, origins in Salt Lake City, Utah, the reddest state of all the red states. So, you know, you can imagine. It, there are a lot of politics. Not there. red in the 1950s. So no, but I mean red sort now. Sort of the opposite. Right. Sort of the opposite. Exactly. What they call red states now. Deeply conservative. And, you know, so it was kind of like, 
uh, being a fish out of water, to say the least. But, you know, it did give me a—it gave me a lot of uh, uh, things to think about and to f kind of uh, attempt to traverse my way through. And Was know. being Jewish in a large Mormon community um, an issue for you growing up? Yeah, it was an issue of fitting in, um, because all of our neighbors were like that. And, uh, you know— uh, did most think you were Mormon? Well, uh, yeah, a lot of them did think we were Mormon because uh, my mother sent us to the Mormon church so that we could fit in with our neighbors, you know. We're, we were, uh, you know, assimilating into the dominant culture. And so we went to, especially me and of all the four of my mom's kids, I went to the Mormon church. and. I was kind of a big star in the Mormon church for a while, too. I used to go around and give speeches and little sermons and stuff like that with my mom for the Mormon church about a healing that happened to me when I was three. Explain. Uh, when I was three years old, I fell and got Bell's—I fell on my face and got Bell's palsy. And uh, it, because it's Salt Lake City, my mother first called a rabbi to pray for me. And the Bell's palsy didn't go away. And then she called the Mormon elders to come and pray for me, and they did, and the Bell's palsy went away. After In how my, long? After uh, 48 hours. And uh, I, I always wonder why a health professional was not consulted, but that's Salt Lake. And uh, later, at age 16, when reading medical journals became my hobby or obsession, I found that Bell's palsy was a 48-hour condition, largely. So it was like a freakazoid. It was just all freakazoid. It was very religious. I was a, in an Orthodox Jewish family the other half of the time, and, and a really uh, staid Mormon community. So I couldn't help but become me, I think. So it's interesting now, as you run for president, that there are two Mormons who are also running That's for right. president. That's right. This is this is our time. <laughs> who were your parents? What did they do? Uh, my parents were Jerome Harold Barr, who was a uh, socialist, and who you know was a great comedian and you know very intelligent person and. Uh, you know, he used to tell us what we say in this house you cannot say outside of this house. Wait, like what? All, all the political things of, uh, you know, being a socialist. And my grandfather was a socialist, too. His name was Sam Barr. And my mother's name is Helen Ruth Davis Barr. And she was kind of the wealthy girl from the other side of the tracks that my dad married, and here I am. So, I mean, I always had a—and the reason I'm telling that story is because I always had—I always was steeped in politics since I was little. So how did you end up going into comedy? Um, I, I was, uh, you know, writing for a woman's magazine called Big Mama Rag, and, uh, you know, I liked writing humor. Um, well, I should say I wanted to write seriously, but it kept turning funny. And so I just kept—finally, uh, I just went to hell with it. When I was 28, I went to hell with it. I'm just going to be funny. Right after, like, uh, you know, Reagan got elected and I saw it all go into hell from, you know, the window of the bookstore I was writing for M Big Mama Rag at, and I just saw it all go to hell on a street level, uh, you know, right there in Denver, Colorado. I saw my first uh, mentally ill people released on the streets. I saw all—in all 1980, like— you know, I saw all of it when Reagan was elected, so I'm like, I, I was trying to hold on by my fingernails. And, and it was like my dad said, it was, you know, they were going to undo everything that people had worked so long and hard for. And I just tried to, you know, tell people that it was happening to them, and I, I did it in a funny way do you remember, and ended up on TV. Do you remember doing your first stand-up? Yeah, I definitely remember when, my first stand-up. Where? 1980, in uh, Larimer Square in Denver, at a place called The Comedy Shop, which later became The Comedy Works and was a fantastic club to develop your stand-up in. But, uh, yeah, my first, uh, my first stand-up act was very radical and very, um, you know, and they didn't like it, and they said, you know, don't come back. So then I had to go around to um, punk bars and um, do my act and, uh, uh, what do you call it? I'm thinking of— uh, Episcopalian church basements and co lesbian coffee houses and biker bars is kind of where I went to develop my act, and it ended up to be a pretty 
because of playing all and and also urban places with uh, you know all black audiences too. So I like got a real mishmash of developing an act, and I think I I think that I I was able to uh, take big ideas and talk in a normal way about them. Well, it's pretty big deal that you're starting this around 1980, and in five years, you're already on Carson. And yeah. I want to go to a clip yeah. of that. In 1985, your debut on national television, appearing on The Tonight Show, hosted by Johnny Carson. Oh, hi. <laughs> I've been married for 13 years, and let me tell you, it's a thrill to be out of the house. <laughs> I never get out of the house. I stay home all the time. I never do anything fun, because I'm a housewife. I hate that word, housewife. I prefer to be called domestic goddess. <laughs> I feel it's more descriptive. And you know what I do all day. Yeah, you're right. I lay there on that couch, eating those bonbons, watching those soap operas, and tuning into that Donahue show. There's a show you could really learn something from. I didn't even know it was possible to be a woman trapped in a man's body. <laughs> Roseanne Barr, 1985. Ago. Not really a million, just like 25, 26 years ago, just a quarter century ago. But I hear the drawl, you know, the Utah drawl, and I think I've dropped it pretty good. So what was the effect of going on Carson for you, for your career, for this country? Well, the very next day, I had enough work that I could move out of Denver and go on the road with the uh, opening for Julio Iglesias. The very next day— Oh, you started singing, tour. too? No, I never—he never allowed me to sing. He was smarter than that. But uh, he was a great person, and, uh, you know, I, I, I had that tour booked the next day for 18 weeks, and, you know, it allowed me to have my family move to L.A. and buy it, put a down payment on a house and change my life. In Rose Anarchy, in your new book, you have um, your first husband write the introduction? Yeah, he wrote the prologue. So that says a lot, that he was willing to do that. I mean, this is many husbands later. Yes. Uh, you went through about four of them, right? Yeah, three, three that I happily divorced. And now I'm in a fourth relationship. But the thing about my first husband and I, Bill, is we have three kids, but we were writers together living on a commune when, you know, and, and Bill was very much a part of writing the jokes that, you know, got me to the Roseanne show and everything. So we've remained friends. And he really is a wonderful writer. So I wanted people to be able to read what it, he's really a good writer. And I like writers. And he describes what it meant for you guys to be raising your kids and then pack up and head to L.A. Talk about that. They were little. They were under 10, all three of them. And, uh, you know, they were little. And it, I don't know, it, it was kind of huge culture shock and all the other things you can imagine for our family. And, uh, and it wasn't three years before we see this debut of Roseanne that becomes the most popular sitcom on yeah, television. Yeah. Right? ABC right. sends you a chocolate number one. Right. They did send me a chocolate number one to uh, celebrate that. And George Clooney and I—George was very funny. He's, he's a joker. And uh, I went out. We went out in the parking lot, and I threw the chocolate number one in the air, and George hit it with the baseball bat. And we took a picture of that and sent it back to ABC to thank them for the chocolate number one, because other stars whose show went to number one would get, like, a Mercedes-Benz or something. But they figured, I'll give the fat lady some chocolate. And I don't know. I just always—that that set me on the road to be perpetually offended.